So let's get started with handset derived location. Thanks to Ina's efforts and the cooperation of mobile OS providers Apple and Google, AML, Advanced Mobile Location, is now widely available in Europe and has really significantly improved caller location during an emergency. Even as AML improves and evolves, there are challenges that remain, and the earlier session touched on it. You've got issues with roaming, you've got indoor location, error rates, etc. At the same time, regulation has also evolved, right? The European Commission mandated caller location for 112 calls and then required that all smartphones sold in the EU must provide handset-derived location beginning March 17, 2022. In late 2022, the European Commission introduced a delegated regulation which requires that member states establish minimum accuracy and reliability criteria for 112 caller location. And member states have to report that criteria to the European Commission by March 5, 2024. So we're going to try and attempt to review and address all of this with our panel of experts. Um, let me start with the folks that are on the stage right now. We have Freddie McBride, who is Director of Digital Communications Policy and Regulation at ENA. Freddie is a senior telecoms expert whose work at ENA revolves around standardization, NG112, and regulatory and advocacy matters. So, Freddie, do you want to kick us off? Thank you, Fiona. <clears throat> um, so, um, Fiona mentioned in her introduction there some of the, I suppose, the background to caller location um, in Europe, and particularly the improvements we've had in the last few years with the implementation of AML. So I'm going to talk about that first. What is the state of play of the implementation of AML in the EU uh, uh, and the European Economic Area? So this is a map. We had it in the, in the presentation earlier. And you can see here that um, the color green means AML is you know, fully implemented. If it's a slightly you know, uh, lighter green, um, it's partially deployed and there's still, there's still some work to do. Um, but we would like to see AML implemented far and wide and even beyond Europe. So at the moment we have 24 EU member states have implemented AML. Um, there's 31 countries in total in Europe have implemented. And then outside of Europe, it's implemented in countries like Australia, New Zealand, uh, the United Arab Emirates, and, and in some, it's available in some piece apps in part of the United States as well. Um, so I'm not going to, you know, talk too much about the ins and outs. There are some issues that need to be resolved, particularly around transmission of AML into the piece apps, uh, but we'll come to that in a minute. Um, and also, just to to let you know that we we publish periodically uh, an AML report card, which gives you a status update on deployment. It is a lot more detail that I'm going to go into right now in terms of how it's been deployed in the different countries. Um, and we expect that the 2023 edition will be uh, published within probably the next two weeks. Okay, so let's move on to uh, this other um, discussion about accuracy and reliability criteria for emergency caller location information. <clears throat> so um, Fiona introduced it. Um, it is a regulatory requirement in the EU. Um, so let's look at you know, some of the legislative background for that. Um, so firstly, we have uh, the European El Electronic Communications Code, which came into effect in 2018. Actually, this is the regulatory framework for electronic communications in general um, in Europe. And uh, th there used to be four directives, and they were consolidated into one directive in 2018. Um, and Article 1096, uh, I believe it is, it, um, I mean, it's got some other... Uh, requirements with regard to, uh, you know, uh, access to emergency services, free of charge access, equivalent access for end users with disabilities. But on location, um, it specifies that the location needs to be delivered to the most appropriate PSAP. Um, that includes network-based location and, where available, handset-based location. And then we have this requirement to lay down criteria. Now, I should emphasize that uh, the, the precursor to the, to the 2018 code, um, there was a universal service directive from 2002 that was amended in 2009, 
Uh, and that's where those, that requirement was initially laid down. But here we are 14 years later and um, it hasn't been implemented in a single EU country yet. Um, and this is part of the reason why it's been addressed in this delegated regulation from the European Commission, which was adopted on, on um, the 5th of March, just, about a, just over a month ago. Um, so it does two things in relation to uh, location criteria. The first is it sets out for parameters for what location criteria should look like. And it does that for fixed networks and mobile networks. And of course, for AML, we're going to talk more about uh, mobile networks today. Um, but I guess more importantly, apart from setting out the parameters, it sets that implementation deadline for reporting. So they need to be adopted by the member states, and, they need, and the member states then need to report to the Commission um, by the 5th of March next year. Um, so, so really, there's an emphasis now to get this done. Now, just going back very quickly to the code, um, when it talks about laying down those criteria, it, it does say in the code that member state authorities should, after consultation with BEREC, implement the criteria. Now, BEREC is a body of European regulators for electronic communications, essentially the, the, the European club of national telecommunications regulatory authorities. Um, now, uh, BEREC has nothing in its work program for 2023 on this topic. We did submit um, a request to BEREC when they did the public consultation to include something um, Berwick does have a little bit of an issue here, I guess, in terms, and that's that its member, its constituent members don't all have the same level of competence when it comes to emergency communications and emergency services. One more thing in the legislation is the case law, and this is also referenced in the delegated regulations, and it's extremely important. Um, what the criteria are supposed to represent is a minimum set of criteria. And what the case law says is, well, why do we have le legislative obligations in the first place? It's to, to achieve a result. And that result is to be able to find somebody when they need help. And what it's, what's written in the, in, the, in the recitals to the delegated regulation is that the location needs to be useful enough for the emergency services to intervene. So when, when we say useful enough, essentially, that means accurate enough. Okay, so a 25 kilometer radius, and t saying somebody's in that 25 kilometers isn't very um, you know, useful in that sense. So um, given Beric isn't gonna do anything on the coordination, um, Ina has decided to do something. Um, so just to remind you before we, 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 we mention that, this is how the accuracy and reliability criteria are set out in the delegated regulation. Um, so accuracy relates to, you know, giving you a radius, and it can also apply to vertical location. And the reliability is a mix of reliability of accuracy and reliability of transmission to the most appropriate PSAP. Um, so what we've done is we've, in, in, in recognizing the need for European coordination and recognizing that no other European body is stepping up to do it, um, we've started work on, on our own recommendation that we will publish um, later in the year. Um, so our approach is we're looking at an analysis of the criteria adopted in other countries. So um, we'll hear about Norway later, um, the United States' criteria, um, New Zealand um, and Canada as well. We've analysed statistics that we've gathered for the survey on the ML report card, and we're, we're going to look for input from key stakeholders in a targeted consultation. Uh, and this is our preliminary recommendation for mobile originated emergency calls. A horizontal accuracy estimate of 50 meters, uh, 50 meters for 80% of all mobile originated emergency communications. Um, so we've done a lot of work already, obviously, because we came up with a preliminary, preliminary recommendation. Um, we're not suggesting a recommendation on vertical location at the moment. There's still work to be done in the PSAPs and in the CAD and GIS systems. To, to present that to the PSAPs in a meaningful and useful way. Um, based on the statistics we've, we've got back, some countries using handset location alone are already achieving our preliminary recommendations. So that's encouraging. And if we use that as a kind of a best practice model and the other countries look at it, even by resolving some of the transmission issues, um, we, can, we can get there, I think, for most countries. But there will be a need probably for network-based locations in some countries. Um, we haven't dealt with that in this because they tend to be specific to the different countries, whereas the technology used for handset locations available everywhere. So we should be able to achieve something common from a European perspective. Um, so uh, we will publish our recommendation in September, and that will give the member states six months uh, to consider the findings before the far, uh, 5th of March uh, 2024 deadline. 
Um, and uh, when we publish it, we also have a workshop on implementing EU law and emergency communications. That will take place on the 19th and 20th of September this year in Brussels, um, and we'll present the full findings um, at that point. Um, so that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. I won't take questions. I'm sure the panel will discuss uh, some of the points that I've raised in the presentation. Uh, and with that, I'll hand back to Fiona. Thank you. Uh, let me introduce Stuart Walsh. So Stuart is the Field Product Director for SS, with uh, SS8, and Stuart is a technical sales professional with 30 plus years experience in voice and data applications for enterprise and service provider customers. So Stuart has a presentation and then we'll save about eight minutes or so for audience Q&A. Thank yours, you very Stuart. much. Uh, it's great to be speaking here at Ina again. Thank you very much to Ina and thank you very much for the previous panel. Hopefully, um, I can actually help to answer some of the questions that came up previously, um, but I won't keep you from your food, I promise. Just to introduce myself a little bit, I'm Stuart Walsh, uh, as we just said, I'm the Field Product Director um, at SS8. I'm actually part of the Location Division. You might have known me, I was part of Creativity Software, which is now part of SS8. Um, but really, what I'm here to talk about really is to follow on from that panel really about how network location can be combined and complement AML to try and answer some of the questions that came up. But I would absolutely reiterate right now, um, which is that you need to test. And I think for the meme here today, it got to be Apple said please, that, that's got to be on YouTube if it, if it comes up. Um, but really, what I really want to cover here is there are still limitations today um, with AML, which has been discussed. It's a fantastic technology. Um, you know, our, our organization was actually involved in advising the foundations of it, which is great, um, but it still can be improved. I'm going to talk about now about how network location can help keep improving that. As it was said by the panel earlier, um, you, you need to strive. You need to strive forward to actually keep improving, moving it up into the upper percentiles, drive, strive to 100%. may never get there, but emergency services should always strive. So really, what I'm going to do is to really give you a little bit intro on our company a little bit, why I'm talking here, what's our experience, why are we talking about combining AML and subcell network location. Um, I'm going to talk about the technologies in use today, and then I'm going to talk about how the network location and high accuracy capability is available to be used, and then I'm going to talk about the combining the AML with subcell and the benefits of that. And finally, just a little map going forward, which will cover um, really emphasizing to all the countries that they should be looking at the regulation and they should be looking at putting a mandate and a measurable mandate. Because as the panel said, if you don't test it, you have no idea how it's performing. So you really need to try and do that. So a little bit about us. Um, we're We've been around for about 18 years, experts in location-based services, which is deriving location out of mobile networks, doing that with standardized technology, uh, helping three GPP standards, uh, but also providing kind of quite powerful products for the suite. As I said, we're an advisory to, uh, board member for EDA, and we also provided expertise um, for the Home Office in the UK and for counter-terrorism terrorism, terrorism around Europe and the world. So, a little bit about why we're talking about combining AML and subcell network location. I promise I will limit the acronyms. I know people look at these acronyms and go, what the hell? But really what it, I'm talking about here is how the mobile network can help close that gap that AML, brilliant technology today, but we need to be striving because we want to be able to help everyone, everywhere, anytime. Um, and you always need to strive, as the panel said earlier, you need to keep pushing those boundaries um, because you, if you start to accept them, it'll just stale, it'll go, get stale. You need to keep making sure that you're driving those reliability, the accuracy, the availability forward. And that's really what we're here to talk about. So really, there are location limitations, some of which have been actually quite nicely facilitated. It was like as if I had planted people in the audience. Um, but, you know, AML... Reliability, it's been fantastic as it's been seen from Johannes uh, that it provides 
quite good reliability, but that varies greatly all over Europe and elsewhere in the world where it's been utilized. And network location today that is being offered is very vague. I think a really good example came from an emergency um, professional in, in, in the UK. He said, it, when we get a cell location, it, it's the equivalent of like a chocolate fire guard because it says they're over there somewhere. It's in that big area. And I have no idea, it could be 35 kilometers. So really you need to start looking at how sub-cell network technologies, which are now very prevalent, can be combined with AML. Um, you want to be able to push, again, as the panel said earlier, push for full population coverage. Cover those devices that don't have AML, such as feature phones, such as watches and so forth. They can still be located. Um, and then auditing is really key. It's a message that we're gonna keep hammering is, if you, don't if you don't measure this or have a mechanism to actually go in and understand why things are failing, as was clearly demonstrated earlier, if you don't measure it and don't audit it, you won't fix it. Um, and people will just take it for granted that that's all the service will provide. So the overriding message I wanna get across here is strive for better. Um, and with what I'm gonna show you, I think you can continue to do that. So, starting current location methods in use today. Um, the oldest one, which was uh, outlined by Freddie earlier and then by the team here is, is cell ID network location. Um, it's a great technology, initially decades ago entered, but it offers, it can offer a pretty vague area. Um, so a lot of emergency people go, well, that's why AML came along, it was really useful because AML transformed how automatic location was provided. It was, I mean, I think everybody here would agree, it, it transformed and saved lives. Uh, it helped revolutionize, you know, basically emergency location, utilizes the smartphones and obtains an accurate location, uh, all done automatically. Um, and it's obviously very cost effective. Um, so it's been very, very useful out there in, in, uh, in, the, in the emergency scenarios everywhere. And I really hope, and I'm very much working with the team at ENA, that it can be beyond the Europe boundaries. Can we get it not only fully dispersed in Europe, but beyond as well? But there are limitations, and that's really where I think combining AML with network location and sub-cell network location specifically where AML success rate varies. Um, so there's been some great examples, um, which Johannes has, has talked about in Norway, but, and you'll see when the report comes out, it varies greatly on how AML, and that can be from a, a wide variety of reasons. Uh, some I'll discuss as I go through this. Um, but for instance, if it defaults down to a cell location, it's really a too large an area to be useful a lot of the time. And again, one of the challenges at the moment is that audit trail. Something automatic uh, is really, really important. So, what do I mean by sub-cell network location? So we've talked about, or you've heard, uh, network location mentioned quite a lot here. Um, has anyone ever heard the term sub-cell network location? <laughs> Put your hands up if you have. I'm not expecting many. Good, so I'm introducing something new to people here. But what it means is using some very good advanced capabilities that are readily available within mobile networks to provide high accuracy location. Um, that's what really it is. It starts obviously where we are today with a cell location, something like that up there. That's just an example. There are many other uh, kind of shapes that are available from cell location. Sometimes it's a circle, but that's a good example you see up there. And what we do with the technology, and it's available, again, it's, it's, it's vendor agnostic because it's been defined by three GPP standards and Etsy, um, and that means you can put it into any mobile network with any vendor, um, is it will calculate by taking neighboring cells and timing information to carve out that shape. So you're going from what, in, say, in a dense urban area would be 500 meters, and you're carving that shape down to 50 meters. And that's, that's really where you want to get to uh, with the technology. Now, there are some, obviously, limitations you need to be aware of because if it's in a very remote area, you may not have that number of cells, but it still gives you, and I was talking to people who work in mountain rescue and coastline support services. At the moment, they might get a cell that covers 35 kilometers 
and this technology would let them get down to 700 or 800 meters, and they said that will save lives. Um, so there's real benefits in this, this technology. So hopefully now, at a very high level, you understand what subcell network location means. <laughs> I'm looking at people going, you're stopping me from my lunch, Stuart. <laughs> um, so hopefully that's really just the first part. But really, um, there's additional detail to that. Don't worry, I'm not going to dive into a multitude of acronyms here. Uh, but it also uses timing information. It also uses round trip time. And there's some terms like uh, multilateration and, and other terms there. But ultimately, it's all using existing facilities within the mobile network to get from where you are today, an example of 500 meters, the cell location, down to that subcell high accuracy capability of 50 meters. And you can imagine that the advantage of that means you can actually provide reliable high accuracy because it's coming from the network. Um, it's full population coverage, so it's agnostic of the handset. It's agnostic of all the types of mobile network generations, 2G, 3G, 4G, onto 5G, and eventually 6G. Um, there's no reliance on the device. Uh, it's comprehensive audit trails. You can track all the details about uh, what happened to that locate as it got from the emergency caller to the PSAP. And it works in a wide range of scenarios, not just for when someone places a call. So it has quite a, an extra facility capability to it. So one of the questions that we always get uh, when discussing high accuracy subcell network is, is it a viable option? Surely it's, it's I'm going to talk about the myths a bit later, but it's expensive, it's hard to put in, and it's very um, custom to networks, which is not the case. Um, standards have been in place now for, for many years based on 3GPP standards and Etsy standards where you can easily implement this. I say easily, but you have to work with the mobile networks, always a, a, a nice challenge. Um, but it means that these can be done quite straightforward using software solutions, so no bespoke hardware. It's just software like a virtual machine or COTS hardware uh, that goes into the mobile network. And in these days, even cloud capability is there. And it's all standards-based, so it's e it, it means that the vendors can actually provide this in there. Typically, it can de be deployed pretty readily within three to six months. Uh, it's a reasonable cost. Again, cost is always a consideration in, in these scenarios. Um, I'm not going to say to you that it's, it's as cheap an option as AML, but it does provide a facility to save lives against its cost benefit. And it has the ability to facilitate other use cases so we can work out multiple different emergency scenarios, not where calls are initiated like AML, but also it can do other types of, of services as well. So if a kid has gone lost and a mother calls up and says, well, they have their phone, but they're not calling, can you locate it? That's, that's an example. But it can be used for, for many different environments. So recommended network architecture, now, this is just an example, um, and this, was, this actually was defined by the Help 112 program. Um, and within that, it said there should be a center of excellence. There should be a AML and LBS area where it can be evaluated, and they can actually compare the AML and the network locate and say which provides the best one. And this will give you, this is shown to give uh, examples where we've kind of deployed this, it gives really good reliability, driving it up to the 90th percentiles and even plus. So when combining the two, I don't see this as, an ev as, an, as, an ev as a revolution. It's an evolution. Um, it, it is something that can be put in um, in, a, in a staged manner, um, and it will help to complement AML. So it doesn't replace AML. It very much works alongside AML, helping to cover the gaps that were discussed earlier about where AML fails sometimes, with AML failed locations, where it improves location accuracy uh, in certain scenarios, and where uh, we, you, we have environments where AML just provided a poor quality. So you're, you're getting that extra cover uh, within it. Again, some of the benefits it's, it's all derived about that combination. You're getting the best of both worlds, ultimately. And then really, um, the path forward is to, to really overcome some of the myths. I'm just going to go through these quickly. People say AML provides, you know, is, 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 doesn't provide enough reliability. Uh, you need to examine the real world results of AML. That's one of the things that the team covered earlier. You really need to test it and evaluate it. Governments need to put mandates in place as per the regulation in order to be able to, 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 to measure it. 
Um, Subcell network location requires bespoke hardware. We get that all the time. Decades ago, that was the case. Now it is based on standards that are available in all mobile networks and all mobile network vendors. So it's, it's really straightforward to implement. Um, it's difficult to integrate. Again, this is a common one we get, but again, it, this has been defined in the standards and has been made straightforward to implement. It's just the will of the government to do it. But there's still some real world challenges, and those are getting the mobile networks to allocate resources and get on board. That's the challenge. Governments need to put that location mandates in place, and the cost of acquiring this will always be one of those hard bits in all of this. Again, just to rush through it, there really is the necessity for legislation and accuracy. We've talked about that earlier with the, with the, with the panel, um, but ultimately a mandate by bringing these two together, you drive towards 100% reliability. That should be the goal. As, as we said before, strive for that and improve your auditing capability, finding out why it failed and keep improving it and make a faster response. So really, um, Hopefully, we'll have time for a few questions. Yes. Um, and if, if we don't answer them, please come by our stand and we'll speak. Please go ahead. Have you got us? Same guys. Rokas uh, Kladras in the Seven Technologies, Lithuania. Um, you know, it's a little bit, a little bit strange for me. Uh, somehow, I was uh, pretty sure that uh, device-based location is using something similar to what you uh, presented like getting information from different cells and uh, network-based uh, location when, when there is no GPS or Wi-Fi location is calculated by triangulation from different, uh, different cells from, from network. So this uh, okay. question, maybe you can comment, I don't know, because uh, somehow... So, so here, here's the general demarker, and if, if the guys are here, they'd comment. But, so what the handset derives to key pieces of information, GPS and Wi-Fi. And if, if the cell tower information is available as well, those is what I get. It doesn't carry out an excuse of an or like a triangulation or get timing yeah. events or that kind of data. Okay, so the cell, uh, the cell phone is not getting the, the information from other towers and then trying to Correct. calculate. Okay, okay, so then, then it makes sense. Please, please come and have a chat. I'd love to, to talk to you about it and yeah. show you more. I've got a great demonstration. Okay. I'll, I'll show you how AML and the network subcell works together. So really would like to talk to you about it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, a, little, a little thing, uh, you've jumped that very fast, but that was the essential part that, uh, to, to my understanding, that uh, uh, governments and regulators must understand that there is a possibility for that and they must ensure that uh, operators invest in this technology if they want that, that kind of improvement. Totally. Absolutely. Without that, totally I don't see you. it coming anyhow. <laughs> Brilliant. And that last question was just fantastic because that's exactly the message. The governments have to, have to drive it. Other questions? How are you doing? Is this on? Yes. yes. Hi, uh, Mick Fox from Comreg in Ireland. Um, what wasn't explicitly stated um, was the question of whether the network-based location would be included in every call or only when the handset location wasn't available. And it strikes me that, depending on which, uh, there's two different options. If it's, if it's a pull uh, network location when, it's, when the uh, device-based location is not available, what, what's, the, what's the latency? Does it take a few seconds? And on the other side, if it's included with every call, does that mean uh, essentially a box in the network tracking every user and knowing where they are at all times? And what are the privacy implications of that? Absolutely brilliant question. You know your stuff. Um, so just to really help that, in front, and it's a very good, it's one of the topics I probably went over a bit about privacy. So from, from the first part is, we would recommend that both happen. So the AML locate and the network locate happen. But the network doesn't locate everyone everywhere all the time. That's really important. It only does a locate push or pull. Typically, the emergency is push. So when you place a, a, a 112 call, the network pushes out the location of uh, the emergency caller out. So that's what happens at, at that stage. Um, and it, it's, it's, as you say, the, the technology can sit in the network or it could sit in a location center capability. Every country does that differently, and you can disperse it if you wish. But to, go, to really answer your question is, we would recommend both and have a stage one location center, as is recommended by Help 112, uh, the program that was funded by EU, 
to actually have a stage one location that will evaluate. Hi, I'm looking at this AML location. It's currently in Munich, but actually the network is showing me in Ljubljana. Which should I trust? And then the, the program will work that out. It'll compare and contrast. So that's, that, you know, that's a really good question. Hope I answered your question, by the way. <laughs> Any other questions? I think we have time for one more very quick this, question. This gentleman down here. Tadas. Location drives, drives me up. <laughs> uh, I have a comment how, again, about network-based location, how it is important to the PSAPs. In Lithuania, for example, AML now totals about 75-80% of mobile calls. So 25-20% we rely on network location. Out of those, within AML, 75-80%, about 10% deliver no location information inside. So again, out of 80%, one-tenth is network location, what we should listen and what should we respond based on. So just a comment. Thank yeah, you. No, absolutely. And I didn't pay him to say that, I promise you. <laughs> that's another meme for the day. Annie, well, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully now you're free to go to lunch. Thanks very much for all yeah. your attention. Thank you for attending.